Dehydration is the number one cause of kidney stone. Sugar dramatically increases the risk for kidney stones, soft drinks do. I think people should just avoid liquid sugar, period. If you want to lose weight, the best way is intermittent fasting or a very low carb or keto diet. Hey everyone, before diving into the episode, I want to take a moment to invite you into our Mind Body Green ecosystem where you can explore the infinite possibilities of health and well-being. All you have to do is click the subscribe button to hear more thought-provoking interviews with leaders in the health space. I am so grateful for all of you who have tuned in over the years, and let me tell you, it's only going to get better. So when it comes to kidney health, you hear a lot of chatter on social media about oxalates and dairy specifically. So once and for all, can we set the record straight on oxalates and dairy and the potential role they play in our kidney health. Absolutely. So uh, at least we can talk about oxalates in pretty good detail. So oxalates are present in a lot of foods and and um, especially things like tea and c- certain types of uh, plants. And and when you eat oxalate, if you if it builds up, uh, it can form stones. It, it's, uh, it can chelate or, or precipitate with calcium. And so kidney stones are often composed of calcium oxalate. There are certain situations where, where people can absorb a lot of oxalate, more oxalate than normal. And uh, the classic situations are, are, for example, like people who have inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's disease or something, they can uh, absorb a lot of oxalate or Another group that can do it are people who've had bariatric surgery. Uh, And so if if your small bowel has been shortened by surgery or something, you can absorb high amounts of oxalate. You can also get oxalate from large doses of vitamin C, not like uh, 500 milligrams a day so much, but like if you're eating like two grams of vitamin C a day, if you're one of these people who take huge doses of vitamin C. And oxalates can build up in in people with kidney disease. So if you have some kidney disease, you may be building up some oxalate. So oxalate, and then there's a hereditary form where you can absorb oxalates very significantly. The main concern about oxalates in the kidney have been in terms of kidney stones. And and so whenever I see a person with kidney stones, I will measure how much oxalate they have in their urine. But it turns out that the most common cause of kidney stones is not from eating too much oxalate. That is actually not so common. Um, And the most common cause of kidney stones, there's two. The first one is dehydration. And when you get dehydrated, the urine becomes concentrated. The urine volume goes down and everything in the urine gets, the concentrations go up. And when that happens, yeah, I'm glad you're hydrating. <laughs> Good man. And uh, anyway, dehydration is the number one cause of kidney stones and in heat stress. And so, in fact, you know, with climate change and with the changing temperatures, the, there's a belt, we call it the kidney stone belt. And that belt goes across Southern United States, across the really hot uh, regions. And it's, expanding and kidney stones are increasing dramatically and it's thought that heat stress and dehydration is the number one cause but there's a second major cause and believe it or not that is soft drinks sugary beverages sugary teas these things are sugar uh actually uh, also dramatically increases the risk for kidney stones, soft drinks do. There are many, many studies that have looked at this. When you uh, drink soft drinks, there's a, there's a sugar, uh, the table sugar contains fructose, and fructose causes a big rise in uric acid in the urine, and it inhibits, it, it lowers inhibitors of kidney stones, and it actually can affect oxalate to some extent too. And we've studied this. And so soft drinks are your other major cause. Eating things like spinach, which is high in uh, oxalate or or drinking tea, high in oxalate, you know, it's very unusual for that to be the cause of kidney stones. It can be. And so 
We, uh, we do test for it. Uh, if you have a shortened bowel, if you had bariatric surgery, I will definitely test for it. But basically, oxalates, uh, the main risk is kidney stones. And uh, there are rare cases where oxalate can build up in the kidney completely and can cause kidney failure. There's rare cases where oxalate can deposit in other parts of the body. Usually, those are people with bad kidney function who are taking in a lot of oxalate, a lot of vitamin C, have shortened bowel, everything together. And then, then you can get into complications. But now, in terms of dairy products, it's a very confusing topic. Um, dairy has both sugars like lactose and lactose. A lot of people have trouble with lactose. They can't break it down very easy. They get a thing called lactose intolerance and they can get diarrhea from it. So some people just don't tolerate milk. Um, there are people who develop allergies to milk proteins and they get stomach pains and so forth. It, you know, milk proteins seem to be one of those things that you can develop uh, side effects and allergies to. Some people have kind of focused on a particular protein in milk called casein. And it's thought that that may be a kind of a pro-inflammatory allergenic protein that can, can stimulate things. But, you know, a lot of people do very well with milk. And, uh, you know, uh, it contains vitamin D and has a lot of things that are very good for people. And interestingly, there's a literature showing that milk proteins and milk can be an antidote for gout and that it can actually help lower uric acid through mechanisms that have not fully been figured out. But, you know, if you go back to the 1700s, the original treatments for gout before they really had any good treatments was to, to you know, milk products. Now, maybe that was because it took you away from drinking alcohol, which can raise uric acid and cause gout. But anyway, so milk is, there's good and bad to it. If you have kidney disease, milk also has phosphate in it and so that you can retain the phosphate. So usually if you have like kidney, bad kidney disease, we tell people not to drink a lot of milk. Not so much because we're worried about the calcium or the lactose or the protein, but rather because of the phosphate content. So milk is a complex food. It, there's some evidence that it's good. You know, my my grandfather told me always drink a glass of milk before you go to bed. And you know, so there's a lot of people who believe that milk's good, and um, but there's also some bad aspects to milk. You know, the phosphate load, the maybe the casein, and so forth. Does that help? <laughs> it, it it does. It does. And we're going to close the loop in a moment. I am curious on the subject of of sweeteners. What about artificial sweeteners like sucralose and aspartame? They do not increase the risk for kidney stones. And in fact, uh, there have been controlled clinical trials where they people will switch from uh, soft drinks to diet soft drinks, and diet soft drinks uh, because they contain fluid and they don't. They don't cause that kidney stone. They're actually kind of like water. And one of the things that, uh, you know, when it comes to kidney stones, so when it, when it comes to kidney stones, you know, there's a lot of issues about diet sugars, okay? But when it comes to kidney stones, they do not cause kidney stones, okay? They do not. They actually are kind of like drinking water when it comes to kidney stones. And that's good. You want to stay well hydrated. Now, there are other issues about diet sugars, but <laughs> yes. And so if someone's concerned about kidney health, they want to track their uric acid and they want to track their cystatin C in summary. Those are kind of the two key. And creatinine. And creatinine. Ideally, where do you want ranges for those three? Okay, so the classic test for kidney function is serum creatinine. And the normal creatinine in a woman it can, is between 0.6 and maybe 1.1. .1. And in a man, it's usually 0.8 to like 1.3 or so. And the re reason for the difference is that creatinine is also a marker of muscle mass. So this is the confusing part. So if you're really muscular, like if you're an NHL a player, a football, NFL football player, or some, you know, one really muscular, your normal creatinine might be 1.4, which would be high for an average person, but it's because of all the muscle mass. So to correct for that, a lot of people will measure cystatin C 
because that also measures kidney function and uh, but it's not affected by muscle mass, but it's not as common a test. So if you just go to your doctor, they're most likely going to measure the creatinine because that's the classic test. And the higher it is, the, the worse the kidney function. So the, a general rule of thumb is that if your creatinine is two, which is twice the one which is normal, consider one to be normal. If your creatinine is two, it's like dividing by two uh, for your kidney function. Your kidney function's at half. If your creatinine is three, divide the one by three and your kidney function's roughly a third. If your kidney if, if your creatinine is 10, your kidney function's about one-tenth what it should be. So that's kind of the ballpark. I mean, we, we have more accurate ways to calculate it, but that's the, uh, that's the ballpark. So the general rule is most people uh, will need something like dialysis or a transplant when their creatinine hits around five. Five is kind of the, that magic number where uh, we start talking about, you know, having a dialysis or transplant to where we, we, we clean the blood for you in dialysis. Uh, there are a lot of people who live with a creatinine of two and do fine their whole life or creatinine of three, uh, and they, you can do fine your whole life. So the good news is the kidneys uh, really have a lot of backup power. So even if they're working at one half or one third, that's usually enough to, to get you through. It's when it gets down to like one fifth or one sixth, that's when you start getting into real significant trouble. So the creatinine and the cystatin C, the higher they are, it means the worse the kidney function. And then there's uric acid. And uric acid is a really funny substance because when it's high, it predicts the development of kidney disease. It predicts the development of high blood pressure. It predicts the development of obesity. It's like a bad, bad player. And we think that it has a role in actually causing some of these conditions. So it's driven by bad diet, really. And it's also driven up when the kidneys start to fail, it goes up too. So it, it can go up because of kidney disease, but it can go up before kidney disease develops, in which case it predicts the development of kidney disease. And what ranges do you like to see those? Well, the beautiful one is uh, around four. In fact, it was just a study. Uh, there was just a study that showed that if your creatinine is four and you're 60 years old, you have twice the chance of another person to make it to 100 years old. Wow. And if your creatinine is six, yeah. I, I mean, it's really not, you, you're, you know, the, the chances of you getting to 100 go way down. So, uh, you know, a normal uric acid is, is between three and six. And if you're around four, the chances of you developing high blood pressure or kidney disease or aging-related problems goes way down. And so uh, uric acid of four is the dream. You know, uh, uric acid of four and a half is a dream. And once it starts going over 5.2, your risk for diabetes, obesity starts going up. It's like a direct line. It's like, you know, from four to to uh, to 10, it, the risk just goes straight up. And so having said that, the, 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 there's controversy over whether lowering uric acid provides benefit. But for example, I pulled five studies that show that if you people who are in medicine to lower uric acid have a lower risk for dementia, for example, than, than people who uh, are not you know, who have a high uric acid and are not on treatment. I'm a believer that uric acid is really a bad guy and that we need to do more studies to prove that lowering uric acid is beneficial. The epidemiology is out there. I mean, if you definitely want to keep your uric acid around four or five. And one of the big ways to do that is to cut back on sugar uh, to drink more water and, you know, to try to avoid eating a ton of food that's really rich in purines, um, the kind of the umami foods like alcohol can raise uric acid, especially beer. Beer is the big one. It's not from the alcohol. It's from, it's from the brewer's yeast. 
which really is filled with purines and it raises our uric acid. Another one that is, is um, I love shrimp. Do you like shrimp? Of course, I live in Miami, of course. <laughs> I love shrimp. I love lobster. I love shellfish. But those, if you eat a ton, a lot of them, they will raise your uric acid. So you don't want to be eating shrimp every day. You know, it's it's really interesting. Our work suggests that sugar is the main driver of obesity and carbs are, but a high purine foods can do it too. And I mean, I had a, when I was in uh, Texas, I worked with a resident who went on a low carb diet, but his father was a shrimp shrimper or whatever you call it, a shrimp fisherman. <laughs> Like like the Bubba Gum Shrimp Company. Yes, that's basically what he his father did. So he would eat shrimp like almost every day, and and he he got overweight quite significantly, despite um, not eating really a lot of a lot of other foods that are are classically thought of as being fattening. But yeah, I would say drink a lot of water. Uh, try not to drink too much alcohol. Try not to eat too many shrimp. But I'm not telling you never to eat shrimp or never to drink beer. And what range do you like to see cystatin C? Well, it's sort of similar to uh, the creatinine. So a cystatin C of you know, like 1 to 1 1.3, 0.8 to 1.3 is pretty good. Interesting. So it's funny, and just, just anecdotally, I, I, I'm not a professional athlete, but I'm muscular. And so sure enough, my creatinine was a little high. It was 136. But cystatin C was 1.17 and my uric acid's low, it's 4.1. Oh, good for you. So that's great. Yeah. So we, you know, the other thing is people take creatine supplements and creatine supplements can help. I, I actually kind of like them because the creatinine uh, is, a, as I say, is in muscle, right? And uh, the bigger, the, the more muscle you have, the more creatinine you have. But creatinine is is actually a reservoir for energy. It holds phosphate. And uh, when you're exercising and you you start running out of energy, the creatinine, what they call creatinine monophosphate, um, can actually provide energy. So I actually like creatinine and it can, I, I think that it can really boost strength and, and uh, provide another additional some additional energy. Having said that, if you're taking a lot of creatine supplements, or it's creatine actually, not creatine. I said it wrong. You take creatine supplements, but it makes the serum creatinine go up. So it's creatine monophosphate. But when the creatinine goes up, it, it's from you taking these supplements. It's not actually a true deterioration in your kidney. So, for example, I'll see a, a guy will come to my office and his serum creat creatinine may be 1.5. And one of the things I ask him is, are you taking creatine supplements? And uh, if he is, you know, that I mean, I will get a cystatin C anyway. The cystatin C will be normal, even though the creatinine will be high. And that's because of the supplements and because the muscle mass is higher. Yes. So let's. Let's come back to obesity, which we briefly touched on. And your thesis here, specifically, you recently wrote a, a paper that was published and, and getting some notoriety. So so talk about that paper. What, what did you find that's driving obesity here? Yeah, notoriety is right. So yeah, well, I, I think it's like, uh, it, it, I think it's it's viewed with enthusiasm, but also with some controversy. Like everything, what isn't these days? Come on, anything that's that's got met with enthusiasm and always a little bit of controversy, all good. So basically, our work suggests that obesity, the way to think about obesity, should we should think about it differently than we classically do. So the you know there's different many people different people have ideas of what causes obesity, and you probably uh, are aware of the carbohydrate model and the people who say it's insulin and the people who say we're eating just too much fat. Some people say we're eating too little protein. There's all these different theories, but at the very basis of it is this concept that, you know, what, what is it when we're eating too much? How does it work? And the classic, classic teaching is that if you eat more than you expend, in other words, uh, if you eat 
more than you should at a certain meal and you uh, are exercising less than you should, that there's excess energy and the calories get converted to energy and then the excess energy gets stored as fat. And so this has been the classic thinking. And the way they, the thinking is, is that, you know, we have two types of energy in our body. We have the energy called ATP, which is the energy that we use to do everything we do, like talking, walking, exercise. Everything we do is based on the ATP that's in our cells. This is the energy we use. But if, the, if we cap off the ATP, if we eat so much food that our ATP levels fill up, then the extra energy gets stored as fat. And fat is a type of stored energy. So when you store the energy in fat, you can burn the fat to provide the energy you need when you need it. So like if you're a hibernating bear, you store the fat so that when there's no food around, now you can burn the fat to make your energy, to get your energy, and it will produce the eight, you can generate the ATP from it, which then allows us to do what we want. So the way you think about it is there's active energy, which is our ATP, and there's the stored energy. And the thinking is that when you eat too much, we fill up the ATP, we fill up the gas tank, and then the extra energy gets stored as fat. But actually, that's not how it works. And the the big trick and i think many people realize this is true now but the big trick is the way that the body gets tricked into wanting to eat more is to lower the atp and the so that you don't is so it's not filled up and when that happens at the atp levels start to drop it sort of signals the to the animal that that there's not enough food around you know that there's a risk of running out it's like looking at the gas gauge and seeing an empty, you know, uh, low. You're not actually empty yet, but you need to go get more gas. And the way this works is there's one nutrient and there's only one nutrient. Al alcohol does it too. So if we count alcohol, there's two nutrients. There's fructose, or, which isn't sugar, and there's alcohol. And they both do the same thing. They drop. Even though they're they, their form of energy, they drop the ATP. They drop the from going from a full tank to a half tank, or to a you know yeah, it's not to a low. It drops it from full to half, and and at the same time, it shifts the energy that comes in into fat. It by it goes straight into storage, and it blocks the stored fat from being burnt to re, to bring the ATP levels up. So it does two things. It blocks the burning of fat and it lowers the ATP. And it does it through its work by working on the energy factories that make ATP. So it actually kind of stuns the mitochondria so they don't make as much ATP. And so what happens is the calories go in that they can't be used to make ATP because you've stunned the mitochondria, which is the energy factories. So the energy goes into the fat, but you then block the fat from releasing the ATP. It's brilliant. What happens is you're eating food and then you, you actually stay hungry because your, your, your gas tank isn't full. And you look and the body goes, I need more fat. I need to eat more. I'm hungry. I'm going to go forage for food. I'm going to take in more energy and I'm going to get fat. And so this this is how it works. And actually, if you take a person who's obese and you biopsy their liver or biopsy their, their muscle and measure the ATP, it's not high. It's low. And that's because the total energy in the person's high because there's a lot of stored fat. That's stored energy. But the active energy is low. That's why when you get really old, overweight, you may be more tired than you, than others, is because uh, you, your ATP levels aren't at what they should be. So what happens is you get hungry, you eat more, and slowly you bring that ATP level up, but at the expense of storing more fat because there's this kind of gradient that keeps wanting to put the energy into the into the fat. So that's the mechanism. So the question is, can that, once you understand that, can we 
suddenly unite all the different theories into one. And this was our paper. And what we did was we realized uh, that the way that the way it works is carbs, carbohydrates, are are really the, the fuel that drops the ATP. So it's the fructose. Fructose is a carbohydrate, so it's in sugar. But the bad news is you our bodies make fructose from carbs. So even if you're not eating sugar, if you're eating a lot of especially starch, starchy foods like potatoes, rice, you eat those, they get converted into fructose in your body and that drops the ATP and causes the craving and causes the metabolic effects and the insulin resistance, but mainly it makes you hungry. And then once you get hungry, there's actually a, a group in London that shows that once the car, once you become hungry like this from the drop in the ATP and the activation of what we call leptin resistance, then suddenly you get a desire for fatty foods. Normally we don't have taste buds for fat, but we start craving fatty foods once you become leptin resistant. So it's like a trick. So, uh, so the sugar and the carbs make you hungry and then you eat the high energy fat because fat has like nine calories per gram. You eat one teaspoon of, teaspoon of fat, you're getting a lot more calories than you do from a teaspoon of fructose. So what happens is the fructose sets you up and then you eat the fat and you gain weight. And when you look at, when you understand this kind of principle that one, you know, the carbs get you going and then the fat drives the weight gain, then it can explain all these different papers that everybody says are, you know, things don't match and this is inconsistent with this. Actually, you can start to explain it. And then you can also explain things like, why is it when you're on a low carb diet, you're actually on a high fat diet, but you're not gaining weight? Well, it's because the low carb diet keeps the ATP levels at normal, so you're not so hungry, so you're not going to keep eating. But if you're eating sugar and fructose, and then you add high high fat diet, now you got that the hunger, and you're you're going to gain weight like that. And and that also explains why, like in Japan, people will get will activate this switch uh, where they drop their ATP and they're hungry, but there's not as much high fat food, so they don't get so fat. But actually, if you look, they're still developing diabetes and metabolic problems, and and that's because the carbs are driving the metabolic problems, like the insulin resistance and so. On. Carbs are really the best. If you look at it, at what is the evilest. It's the carbs that are the problem. And then the fat is the driver. Fat is the gasoline that, you know, if you light the fire, a fat is the firewood and the, the actual flame is from the carbs. So that's sort of, you know, so what we did is, you know, every I was at this meeting in London and uh, where all the different leaders on obesity came together and there was like no consensus because it's carbs, the problem, it's sugar, that's the problem, it's high fats, it's seed oils, but actually they all are the problem. Everything does fit in there, too little protein, they're all in there. It's just that they all kind of fit together based upon this uh, this model in which it's all about the interest uh, about the ATP and and fructose is a key player in that so so that's what the paper was about so i think many are on board with the excess consumption of alcohol and excess consumption of starchy carbs i, I think many many agree that this is going to hurt your ability to 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 lose weight or maintain a healthy weight but then fructose, you know, fructose is a big catch-all category. Fruits have fructose. So all, all fructose is not created equal. All fructose is not created equal. So let's talk about that because I don't think we want to demonize fruit here. How should we think about fructose? The very first thing is, yeah, if you just put an animal purely on fructose, and we've done this where, where you, basically the, it's just fructose, then we don't get fat or anything. 
they will they will develop metabolic problems, but they won't uh, gain weight so much. They really need that high fat with the fructose to really gain to really gain a lot of weight. Uh, so that's the first step. But you can still become diabetic and all those things, hypertensive. Uh, you know, a lot of the metabolic things, but weight gain to really gain a lot of weight, it really is a combination of that. The high fat is re really drives it up. So that's the first thing. But the other thing is that the, the way the fructose is given makes a huge difference. So the way fructose lowers ATP in the cell is through the concentration. The higher the concentration, the more the ATP depletion. And it's really, uh, it's like a dimmer switch. It's not off and on. It relates to how much fructose is seen. So for example, if I drink a soft drink filled with sugar and I guzzle it, the amount of fructose hitting my li liver will come as a wave and it will absolutely drop the ATP and trigger this biologic thing. But if I took that same soft drink and I sipped it very, you know, one sip every 15 minutes, it would just be a calorie. It would just be a calorie. It would not be enough to drop the ATP to activate this process. So a clarification that I want to give a, a, a probably a more applicable use case, because I don't think our audience drinks soft drinks for the most part. However, I'm going to, I'm going to use the use case of a banana. And so I like bananas. I will put them in my grass-fed whey protein smoothie after working out. So I'm drinking it. And look, I don't want to demonize bananas, but bananas have a lot of sugar. Am I better served not putting the banana in the smoothie and just having my smoothie as is and then separately eating a banana. Let me answer that, but first let me just talk about fruits in general. So fruits contain fructose. Bananas contain fructose. But bananas, by the way, also contain a lot of glucose, by the way. So they can contain different sugars. Typically, fruits mainly contain fructose. Some fruits contain sucrose, or which is fructose and glucose, and some also contain glucose. Bananas are kind of relatively unique in having a fair amount of glucose content as I, my understanding. And I believe that, but let me just, so I'm going to get to the banana in a second. Cause that's obviously important <laughs> for you. And I love bananas too. So. Well, I, th I think it's a good use case in terms of drinking, drinking, drinking it or eating it. But let me just begin with the fruit. So when you get a fruit in the beginning of the season, the fruit tends to be tart. And then as the fruit ripens, the sugar content goes up. Interestingly, fruit also has other things in fruit, like fiber, like vitamin C, like flavanols, like quercetin and epicatechin and all these things. And we have potassium. And we have actually tested uh, in animals and found that fruits, um, that the fructose in fruits is neutralized by a lot of these other things. So the fiber will slow the fructose absorption so it doesn't come as a big wave. The vitamin C actually counters the way fructose works. Fructose stuns the mitochondria. Vitamin C kind of blocks that. So you can, it actually is like an antidote to some extent. It's a weak antidote, but it is an antidote. Epicatechin is also uh, blocks the, the damage to the mitochondria it's a, it, and to the ATP. So it is an antidote. So the point of the matter is that when you eat fruit, there's all these things in the fruit that kind of block the effects of fructose. Even the potassium blocks it a little bit. And so a natural fruit doesn't confer the same amount of risk as a soft drink. First, there's a lot less fructose. There's only like three to four grams, maybe six grams. And then secondly, the, the intestine removes some of the fructose and it's really the fructose in the liver that counts. So you got all these, if you eat a natural fruit, it's wonderful. It can, all the good things in the fruit are really there to help. As the fruit ripens, the sugar content goes up and the and a lot of the good things go down. So really, really ripe fruit 
is a little bit more fructose than a, a regular tart fruit. And if you eat a bunch of fruit together, you can overwhelm the good aspects. So if you eat like five, four or five fruit at once, you're going to get a pretty significant sugar load, especially with certain fruits. Like kiwi doesn't have much sugar. Uh, lemons have none. So it really depends which fruit you eat. But some fruits will have a fair amount of sugar if you eat a lot. Now, bananas, there's some good and bad parts to bananas. So one is they have a lot of potassium. And the, as I mentioned, potassium can counter the effects of fructose. So that's the good part. The bad part is they, they, they tend to raise blood sugar more than a lot of fruits. So uh, I, get, I, I have this CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, not because I'm diabetic, I'm not, but because uh, I, I believe in trying to see how my glucose levels go because I know when my glucose levels go up, it stimulates insulin, which I don't think is good, but it also the higher the glucose goes, the more it will get converted to fructose. So I try to keep my glucose levels relatively low. And one of my terrible things that happened to me is when I started doing this, I, I always had thought that, you know, oatmeal, a little bit of oatmeal would be okay. A little bit of banana would be okay. And I, you know, I, I learned that, you know, this is like a healthy breakfast, oatmeal. And, and unfortunately, Oatmeal raises blood glucose pretty well, and so does bananas. And I found that uh, it was better to eat uh, steel oats, which doesn't raise glucose as much, and to use like a half of a banana instead of a full banana to try to keep my glucose levels down. And so I'm aware that bananas can raise glucose. They, they have potassium. In your case, if you drink your smoothie fast, you will get a faster load than you will if you eat it separate. But we tend to eat bananas fast anyway. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know which is better. But I do know this, that um, if you do make a smoothie, keep the fiber in there, you know. Don't get rid of the fiber. And, and you know, there's a lot of healthy things. that w You say you use whey protein. Is that what you're? Yeah. I, I'm not an expert on that. But, you know, I think that, that protein in general is good. Uh, it really is satiating. It's a good thing to eat. You know, higher protein seems to be associated with better outcomes in people. And I like it. I like what you're doing. Now, if you put a lot of fruit in that, I would be w more worried. If, if your smoothie has like three or four fruit in it, that might be too much. So it, it sounds like the takeaway for people is, you know, have fruit. Fruit is good. but probably don't overdo it in terms of adding more than two or three fruits. Be aware that uh, banana is probably going to be a heavier load. And then I think the memo too here is protein and fat. So you mentioned the oats with the banana, you know, probably better if you added some protein and fat in there. That's, yes. That's the other thing too. I, I've experimented with the CGM, have the protein and, and fat in there too, because we don't want the, you know, I, I think this is a delicate subject with people. There's a lot of chatter on social media about demonizing fruits and they're, they're no good and bananas are- Yeah, I don't demonize fruit. I know you don't, but I just wanted to make it clear to people, you know, okay, banana raises your, if you're experimenting with the CGM, banana raises your glucose, like it's going to be okay. Exactly. You know, I think that we're still learning a lot about everybody's different about how, how much they absorb. And, you know, if you do have a CGM, you can kind of figure out yourself what's safe for you and what's not in terms of, you know, trying to keep that blood glucose from going up to 170 or something. I found that if I eat a hamburger, that is the bun that's the bigger problem. There's a lot we can learn. You know, um, I did this, you've probably done this too. You know, if you, if you eat a piece of toast, I, I like toast, right? You know, I was, when I was young, my, my college roommates gave me a loaf of fresh bread for my birthday because they knew that I liked bread more than cake. And <laughs> so it's so disappointing that bread, you know, may not be so healthy for us. But if you take a, you know, if you take a slice of toast and you put avocado on it, you can really block that glucose response. And so, you know, there are ways to try to beat the devil. Yes. 
have have a great great rye, great sourdough. Have a little avocado before. Oh my gosh, I love rye sourdough bread. It doesn't raise my blood glucose. It doesn't. And then the the hack of adding a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar right before. What a good good idea. I think that we should look at diet. It is not so you know like oh my god you can't ever eat this or that, but we should be a little bit more resourceful and try to figure out, you know, how, how to make life enjoyable and the foods we eat enjoyable, but just try to keep it as healthy as we can. And I also think one of the, the takeaways, which is important is really, look, sugar is going to happen. It's going to happen. There's going to be a birthday cake. There's going to be a donut. There's going to be a cookie, whatever it is, it's going to happen. It's part of life. Enjoy it. But you should probably try to avoid drinking sugar. Because it's the way that impacts. So that's like in your coffee and your smoothie and what it just, it, it's just really try to avoid that. We did a study where we, we gave apple juice and you had to drink it like it was an experiment. Okay. So we, people would drink it like in five minutes or drink it over an hour. And there's a huge difference in terms of the biology. So I, 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 I think people should just avoid liquid sugar, period, because no one drinks it slow. You even fruit juice, just, you know, I, if you have to have fruit juice, get the four ounce, don't get the big 12 ounce sweetened drinks, sweetened teas in the South. You know, they have a lot of these sweet teas. Everyone loves them. Gosh, avoid it. This sweetened sugary beverages are the number one activator of this AT dropping the energy in your in your cells. It's just the number one. So in terms of, there, there are a lot of natural alternatives now. You've got monk fruit, you've got allulose, you've got stevia, the list goes on and on. All, can you talk a little bit about some of the alternatives that you encourage people to explore? Yes. So, but I have to make a disclosure, a new disclosure, Jason. I, I know what this is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, about two months oops, about two months ago, I was approached by a company called RX Sugar. They're making allulose products. And they asked me if I would consider being a scientific officer for them in addition to my work at the university. And allulose, just so people know, is a natural sugar. It's like found in figs and and fruits, believe it or not. Small, very small amounts, and everyone's eating it every day, but you don't know about it because we're only eating like one gram of it a day or less. And so we, it's considered safe. And um, But what's interesting is it looks like fructose almost exactly, but it doesn't cause that energy depletion. So when you give it to an animal, they don't drop their ATP. And in fact, it seems to be a safe, low calorie alternative. It's not as sweet as fructose, so that may be an issue, but it's basically appears to be safe. And in fact, it, there's data suggesting that it stimulates GLP-1, the same thing that Ozempic does, these drugs that cause weight loss, and it can block blood sugar rise. And so it has all these things. And so I ended up agreeing to join the company and I'm learning all about allulose. In the group of, of sugars that seem to be safer than others, yeah, stevia, you know, monk fruit are kind of at the top of the list. And so would, so would be allulose. Those three would be at the top of the list of being the, currently considered the safest. And allulose may have some advantages, but beware, I'm now the scientific officer. One of the reasons I wanted to be scientific officer is so I can actually do some studies and you know, do some science on this. I'm hoping to help shed more light on how this works and so forth. Well, congrats on the new role at RX, RX Sugar. I don't know if you know this, but I go way back with Dan Crater, who's on the executive team. Oh yeah, you know Dan? Dan knew me back when I had excruciating sciatica, when he was uh, running highball and I was part of a, an organic chocolate chip cookie company that was in every Whole Foods in the country. I was a co-founder. Uh, different, different life. Not so good for the, you know, it definitely had, definitely had sugar, but those cookies were good. But I go way back. Yeah. 
I bet you they were. And it makes sense. I personally, I'm partial to allulose, and I actually, I really like monk fruit a lot personally. Yeah, I like monk fruit too. I, 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 I those are my two favorites. Stevia has a little bit of an aftertaste. Yes. I think stevia, you can really make nice desserts with stevia. And so, anyway, the, uh, the, there are artificial sugars that I think we should try to not eat a lot of. Like aspartame is really probably not as healthy as people think. I think saccharin is not good, been associated with bladder tumors and sorbitol, which is, uh, which is used in syrups, uh, it gets converted to fructose. So there are, there are some artificial or low calorie sugars that I don't recommend. And then there's some that I'm more neutral on. Interestingly, although the world doesn't really like Splenda or sucralose because it's got chlorine in it, I can't find too much that's bad about Splenda, but, I, but I'm not a... Just the chlorine. <laughs> I'm not an advocate either. Yeah, chlorinated hydrocarbon sounds like it sounds like what you get to kill uh, insects or something. But but anyway, but yeah, but I, I it's true. I don't really know of studies that are saying Splenda particularly specifically is bad. But I don't. I tend not to recommend it just because I'm, you know, these other more natural products seem seem better so if, if you had to generalize what is the optimal diet for people looking to be healthy feel good and maintain or lose their weight well i tell you one thing we are eating too much carbs we did this study in in laboratory mice and laboratory mice eat eat a kind of a high carb diet that kind of the typical foods for laboratory mice is like 60 percent carbs and we, we did a study where they were not getting sugar, but they were still getting so much carbs that they were making fructose. And when we blocked that pathway, the, we could block a lot of aging. And I think that we're eating like 50, 55% of our diet is carbs is too much and that uh, it's probably playing a role in aging and reducing carbs will have the effect of reducing total energy intake a little bit. And I think that it, 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 the, the, in general, we want to eat a lower carb diet. So if you had to look at the, the pie, so to speak, how, how should we think about dividing that pie in terms of protein, sugar, fat, and carbs? What, the, what should that roughly look, at, look like in a percentage basis? It's a tough call. The first thing is uh, most people are eating about 15% protein. And that's thought to be a little bit on the low side. So a lot of people would try to push the protein content up to like 20%. I'm like Peter Atia and Gabrielle Lyon are like changing the world here with protein consumption. <laughs> Some of them are arguing 25, 30 or more, but it's very, very hard to, to eat a very high protein diet chronically. A lot of people do. It's expensive if you're an animal lover. I mean, there's all kinds of things. But I, I would say that for the typical person, trying to push the protein up a bit would be a great move. 20, 20, 20, you know, if you could get to 23, 25%, I think that would be pretty good. And then for the carbs, if you could drop it down to 40%, 35%, I would seem to, to me to be pretty good. And then the rest is fat. Probably reduce seed oils and, you know, the Mediterranean diet. It is a pretty good diet. Uh, the, I have a in my book. I have a diet in my book. Nature wants us to right here. Nature wants us to be fat. There it is. It's a great book. Can't forget to plug the book. Yeah, and and in there I go through the, you know the science and you know basically a Mediterranean diet maybe with a little bit less carb is sort of what what I propose. It, it's true. A carnivore diet will work because you're it's a low carb diet. You, if you've got kidney disease, a carnivore diet may not be ideal because the high protein has been so associated with making kidney disease worse. So in closing, you mentioned seed oils, which is so trending in it and also such a hot button topic. So what's your what's your quick take on seed oils? Leave us something on on that subject. Polyunsaturated fats, omega three and omega six uh, make up these fats. 
omega-3 is good. You know, things like salmon, walnuts that are rich in omega-3, they actually counter the effects of fructose in the brain. They're anti-inflammatory. Boy, I love uh, I love eating salmon and, and walnut oil, put it on salads. And, uh, you know, uh, omega-3 is good. It's absolutely good. Omega-6 in the literature, there is controversy. And it can be pro-inflammatory in some studies and other studies it's not. But I think that at first it's a, it, you know, if you're eating a lot of carbs, eating seed oils is going to be, is going to make you get fat because it's, uh, it, again, it's fat, right? And fat has nine calories per gram. So just as a fat source, when you're eating it with carbs, it's going to be a problem. But the other thing is, I believe that it will tend to be more pro-inflammatory if the switch is turned on and the switch is turned on when you're eating a lot of carbs. So if you're on a low carb diet and you don't have the switch turned on, I don't think seed oils are, are, are much of a problem. But if you're eating a lot of carbs, seed oils probably are going to be a little more pro-inflammatory because they're mainly omega-6 and they're going to, you know, they, they could be a problem. So, you know, in my little paper that brings everything together, I say, you know, seed oils can be bad when they're given with the carbs. There's a, it's a combination. It's a one-two punch. French fries. Yeah, French fries. Love them, but, you, you know, you got to love them and hate them. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the context, you're not saying 5% carbs. You're, you're much more reasonable here. Yeah, well, I'm saying in general for a healthy person, now, let's say you want to lose weight. If you want to lose weight, the best way is intermittent fasting or a very low carb or keto diet. Those two are the best ways to lose weight in my mind. And, and the reason is, is uh, both of them are cutting back on the carbs and giving time for the fat to burn. And they both are pretty effective. I like both. Intermittent fasting is actually sort of the easiest. Because you don't really have to think too much. You just have to, you know, <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. But if you do do intermittent fasting, still don't drink soft drinks. Don't just try to cut back on the cakes, you know, you know, because uh, absolutely. But intermittent fasting is the easiest. I agree. And it works pretty darn well. So if you want to lose weight, intermittent fasting or keto, but if you want just a healthy diet like you, man, I, you shouldn't, I, I don't think you need to be on a keto diet. You would. Unless you're chronically on one. No, I'm pretty, I, I would say I'm probably like almost an even pie, you know, 33, 33 in terms of protein, carbs, and fat. If I were to, I don't track macros, but that's my guess. That would be a dream. A 33, 33, 33 would be fantastic. It's just, it's hard for people to, to eat 33% protein, but you know, if you're putting in protein shakes and so forth, you probably can do it. Yes. The shakes do, and uh, what one percent donuts? I like donuts, so the, the, the remaining one percent of that pie I'll allocate to donuts. A voodoo donut, oh my god, so strange! So I like donut voodoo is the famous one, and uh, there's one of, it's in Portland, I think. Portland, Oregon, yeah. No, someone brought me one, and and I ate it, made sure no one was taking a photo of me, <laughs> but. But it's uh, I have to say, those are those are super sugary. I, 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 I would not eat too many of those but you know you got to live and if you're going to have a donut have, have a damn good donut well, well i like that we're having a little add a little levity to this conversation get a little too serious with the all the biohackers yeah exactly thank you so much thank you too you know it's a real pleasure being on your show again really it's fun thank you 